just, just don't struggle. Just look at me. Look at me through this whole ordeal, and we'll be fine. You don't have to talk. You don't have to move. You don't have to satiate yourself for just a little while. And your wife will get along just fine sleeping one night without being devoutly screwed by her commanding but loving husband. I happen to know that that woman hasn't had a single good night's sleep since she bore your first child. Huh. I talked about my background the other day, remember? About how I came to be in this tiny little Midwestern town, and this uh, pristine cult compound with an interminable and exhausting contract that'll, that'll probably last years with a substantial paycheck. Most I've made since some, um, well, I don't know, uh, well, since my 20s. I used to work most of uh, NBC's late night, uh, late night shifts. I told you then uh, how lucky I felt to, to get this gig. Yeah. My kid, well, he'll get a chance to go to college and um, we didn't think that was going to be possible a few years ago. Got a good health care plan, and uh, yeah, my family's going to be well taken care of. <laughs> yep, considering my frustrating career choice. <laughs> uh, you know what my first job was out of, out of film school? I got to work with a great but quite staunch Mr. Peter Ware on that highly successful film Dead Poets Society. That was my first long-term gig. <laughs> and it seemed like it would last forever, too, because uh, Mr. Ware, he was under the impression that uh, rehearsal time on film is just as important as the actual takes. Yeah. You know, the, the kids in that show, they're, well, they're kind of enslaved, come to think of it. I mean, sure, they were psyched. And, some of them are still in high school, getting to play hooky with Robin Williams. <laughs> we entertain them constantly. I mean, constantly. <laughs> God, he wouldn't shut up to save his life. <laughs> uh, but still, you know, I think for most of them, it was more agony than, uh, than you know, summer camp. It was, yeah, some of the lead boys, they'd have these crying jags that would just last for, I don't know, for hours at a time. Well, mothers and fathers were called constantly. And no cell phones, no, no cell phones. So these kids, they'd have to stand in line for hours just for a chance to get on to one of those rotary phones to be able to talk to their families for just a few minutes. And I promised myself, I promised myself that after that, I would never, ever feel that personal exhaustion ever again. Not ever. You know, uh, film crew members, we have this habit of making promises, just crazy promises after every shoot. You know that? Yeah. yeah. From the two or three day commercial shoot to the pain in the ass music video to those narcissistic hurry up and wait for those A-listers to finish their midday brunch <laughs> so you can do that off day reshoot. <laughs> but this, well, as you can see, this crew member finally lost it. <laughs> oh God, I saw it coming. I did, I did. Jesus Christ, when your sweet, innocent wife announced, on air of course, that she was knocked up for the 14th time? <laughs> uh, and then I, I, I knew it again when I, I hear these disturbing off-camera conversations <clears throat> by all the elders about how God's army is almost ready to roll. <laughs> oh, man. I remember the birth of Suzanne. Yeah. You know, I had to fight. I had to fight to get a microphone in there. Because all these elders, they all squeezed into this tiny little room. And, I mean, I've done crowd scenes before, but I gotta tell you, this, this was something 
<coughs> entirely different altogether. Well, there were times when we would do these late night shoots, you know, to make up for that lacking episode time. And I swear there were times I, I thought I was going to drop the boom, wiping the tears from my eyes, wa watching your young ones desperately pleading to, to go to bed. <laughs> I mean, to go to bed, like, like going to bed is a privilege for a 10-year-old child. I know your history, man. Frontwards, backwards. I know the history of John Connell. <laughs> Military, religion, family values, as warped as they are. Misogyny, bigotry, unbridled lust, patriarchal fascism. But above all, godly justification. Now that last one, it just makes... Everything you do just hunky dory, doesn't it? Mr. Connell, I brought you here to tell you to please stop having sex with your wife. <laughs> now you're bound in gag so that, well, so I can make sure you're hearing me clearly. <laughs> If you're fearful that you're in danger of being hurt or even killed, well, all's the better, wouldn't you say? <laughs> well, I've said all that I had to say, and I, and I hope you heard me. Well, it's just not fair to your, to your adoring wife, to your neglected kids, to the <coughs> millions of viewers who, who emulate or at least Fascinated by this this evil lifestyle, it's time to stop, Mr. Connell. Look, I, I'm going to leave you here now, hopefully for the night, so that you can think about what I've said. I'll leave a note prominently displayed up by that colossal things to do <laughs> chart you have upstairs, telling where you are and along with the detailed diatribe of our little conversation. And then, well, I'm out of here. I don't know where, but, uh, well, we got enough cash to get us by for a little while, and uh, somewhere secluded. But um, in the meantime, just think of me as some Dickensian specter who's come to show what little light there is left of your <coughs> wicked and demented little life. So long, Mr. Connell. Godspeed. <laughs>